Ok, good morning. Buenos días. Good morning and welcome to one of the first sessions this morning. As many of you will probably agree, over the last year, we have witnessed a fundamental change on the art of writing. And yes, that includes academic writing. Today, we are going to share with you examples from our institutions about what we've done to proactively assist students and faculty navigate an increasingly AI-powered environment. So, we will start with Jolyn from Carnegie Mellon University. She will talk to us about Kinius, an AI tool which is fully embedded in the writing process. We will continue with Ben from the University of Maryland. He will talk to us about their collaborative work to create a Canvas module available to everyone at their campus. Then, Leo from the University of New Mexico will share with us the findings of an AI exploration project that they did with a group of library employees. And finally, I will talk about SIGHT, another AI tool that was built specifically for academic writing and research. Uh, we plan to have a few minutes at the end for questions. And with that, we'll start with Jolyn. Thank you for that introduction. I'm already fired up for this session. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jolyn Paspa, and I'm the Director of Library Services at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, and I'm going to talk about Kinius. Um, here's a little bit of background about CMU um, with a nice winter scene with Hunt Library in the background there. Um, I just wanted to sort of emphasize that CMU is frequently cited as the birthplace of AI, and um, the, for the purpose of this presentation anyway, just to say that um, I think that our landscape is pretty open and receptive to implementing new technologies and experimenting with new technologies, so that's really helpful in this kind of environment. Um, and then just to sort of frame up our problem space where we were about a year ago, much like many libraries, we are asking ourselves some questions. Um, so how could we increase pathways for our users to discover and access library resources? Um, I've read the studies that talk about how researchers don't tend to start their research at library web pages, which isn't shocking. So what opportunities could we find to meet our users where they're doing that research? And we also wanted to think about ways that we could kind of educate researchers and users to form better search queries. And so are there ways that, you know, they could, were, would there be ways that they could distill their research questions into topical searches for improved search results? Which then leads us to Kinius, which is an AI-powered recommender tool that's designed to assist in the discovery of relevant research articles, and it does that by analyzing any text that you put into it, basically. So it comes in a few different flavors. There's a web-based version of the tool, um, but then there are also plugins that integrate with Microsoft Word and Google Docs, and that sort of goes back to what I was saying before about meeting users where they are. So if you're reading a paper that you think is really fantastic, uh, and you're reading it in Microsoft Word, you could actually see the recommendations to other articles in the tool while you're using Word. So that's, I, that's a thing that we really like, the flexibility and portability of the tool. Um, so here's a screenshot of what Kenius looks like. Um, and so the, the left-hand side is the Microsoft Word version of the plugin, and you can see Kenius on the right side there, that little menu that pops up with different journal article recommendations. There's also the topical search or topical recommendations in the middle, and then on the right-hand side, you can see how Kenius at the article level links back to the library link resolver and some of the topics that it suggests for that article level metadata. And because Kenius utilizes AI technology, we did end up asking ourselves some questions and thinking about things differently than maybe we would have for the average library database or subscription tool. Um, but spoiler alert, uh, Kenius, you know, passed with flying colors for us and checked all the boxes. But um, you may be wondering how it arrives at its recommendations. So it does use Open Alex for its article recommendations, which if you're not familiar is sort of like the open alternative to Google Scholar. 
brought to you by the great folks who are responsible for unsub and unpaywall. So we really liked that it wasn't tied to a particular content provider, and so we didn't have to necessarily question whether they would be motivated to direct traffic back to a platform or a publication. Um, so there was a bit of neutrality there. And Kenius was a very young company about a year ago when we first learned about its existence. And we were actually the first institution in the United States to implement the tool. Um, and I think thinking about the product roadmap is really important. This landscape is changing constantly, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And so, you know, at the time, we wanted to scrutinize that a little bit more closely. But it's also something that I think is an ongoing conversation and something we need to be aware of as time goes on to make sure that you know, the product and the, the company still kind of align with what we consider to be important to us in making our decisions. Um, and I just wanted to, in my final slide, just talk a little bit about how we are looking at the impact of the tool and its uptake on campus. Um, and it's, it hasn't been that much time yet, and so we are still asking ourselves the best way to go about assessing the tool. Um, but these, some of these are maybe more traditional metrics that you might be used to. Um, but we are also, you know, thinking about things like is, is user retention important in this environment? I don't think that's something that we talk about a lot in, our, in a lot of our other library tools, um, but that's, I, can, I can talk about that graph in more detail if you have questions, because I admit it's not very easy to read. Um, but we're also encouraged to see that our total number of unique users started to tick up at the beginning of the fall semester, and also traffic to our link resolver started to go up um, in, the, in the fall semester. So we are happy with you know, its, its adoption on campus thus far. Um, and that's about all I have time for, but I'm happy to answer questions. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Jolyn. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the AI and information literacy Canvas module that we created at the University of Maryland College Park. So I'll start with a bit of context about my institution and the impetus behind this module. So the University of Maryland College Park is the flagship institution of the University System of Maryland, an R1 state school with a sizable student population. I work in the Teaching and Learning Services Unit at the University of Maryland, which primarily focuses on first-year education across disciplines. Our library instruction includes a focus on source evaluation activities and other information literacy concepts. After the release of ChatGPT and the explosion of interest in AI that followed, there was a lot of uncertainty around AI among faculty and librarians at Maryland as there was across the country. There were concerns around plagiarism, concerns around what this meant for curricula and education as a whole, and specifically what the effect would be on our campus. In addition to this uncertainty, we saw demonstrated information literacy gaps uh, around AI as the spring semester went on. Just like many other institutions, UMD libraries received a large influx of requests for books and articles that did not exist, the result of students and faculty using generative AI to create a bibliography, not realizing it was possible for AI to generate non-existent material. So how would we address these issues to a large user population? In partnership with the Teaching and Learning Transformation Center, which is our on-campus pedagogy and teacher training center, uh, we decided to create a module in Canvas, our LMS, that could be integrated into any course across campus via Canvas Commons. We also created a parallel lib guide so any student could access these resources even if their instructor chose not to include it in their course space. So what would this module entail? Through internal conversations, we came up with a few goals. First, obviously, we wanted to address our previously mentioned information literacy gaps. We were seeing that our users were automatically trusting AI output without fact checking, and this was showing up in student assignments as well as our ILL requests. We also wanted to move away from the plagiarism issue that had dominated the conversation so far and reframe towards helping students become informed users of new technology. Rather than being scrutinized and under suspicion from instructors, we hope to invite students into a more open learning space to learn about this technology that will become an increasingly critical part of the information systems that they navigate every day. In a similar vein, we wanted the project to reach a broad variety of students without alienating them, including both AI users and non-AI users. We hope to create a resource that none of these groups would reflexively dismiss. We wanted it to be easily integratable, widely applicable across disciplines, and we wanted to focus on practical skills for students not bound to any particular AI tool. We wanted to make it as evergreen as we could, so we were focusing on information literacy skills that can be applied to multiple AI tools even as the field rapidly changes. Applying these principles, we had to decide what key skills and information to include in the module. We had conversations with faculty members and students, compiled frequently asked questions from users, and experimented extensively with generative AI tools, using them in ways that align 
line with how we've seen first years do research. We were able to use existing resources for online source evaluation and concepts like lateral reading, modified for an AI context, and we decided to limit the scope to university research to ensure the content was as relevant as possible for our undergraduate users. So with all of that in mind, the final module ended up having four sections. The first section was a dive into how AI tools work on a basic level. We have a video explaining the basic mechanics of generative AI and giving some examples of AI tools. We also have another video going into some of the conversations that are being had around bias, labor, and privacy in AI. We include examples of these issues and screenshots of some of our conversations with ChatGPT and Bing AI. We thought it was important to include these aspects of AI since they are also fundamental parts of how these tools work. In the next section, we talk about assessing content for accuracy. This is where we introduce many of the concrete skills that I discussed earlier. We have a roundup of some common errors made by text-based AI, and we demonstrated some lateral reading exercises with videos showing a full fact check of a response given by ChatGPT and a quiz giving students a chance to practice the skills on their own. We also had a section on citing correctly, going over some of the MLA, APA, and Chicago styles that have started to be set for AI-generated content. And finally, we had a page about exploring further resources, including a roundup of AI tools, the Dolly prompt book, and some other suggestions for ways to experiment with integrating AI tools into your workflow. We're happy to have received a positive response, both on campus and from other institutions. Our next step is to do a more in-depth survey of the module and how the module is being used. We'll be updating the mod module periodically. Um, and our next goal is to talk about strategies for analyzing AI content that you yourself haven't generated. I want to give a quick special thanks to my co-authors, Mona Thompson and Daria Yako, as well as the Institute for Trustworthy AI and Law and Society, who created the videos I mentioned earlier. If you want to explore the module yourself, you can go to bit.ly slash AI Elms. And if you're interested in integrating this into your institution, or one of your courses, please contact me at bshaw1 at umd.edu. Thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it over now to Leo. Hello, everyone. I'm Leo Lowe, uh, Dean of the Libraries at University of New Mexico. Uh, so after ChatGPT came out, I was one of those people who just talked nonstop about it to all my people. And, they, um, and I just kept talking about it. I, I, I encouraged them to use it. I, I would tell them I use it all the time. Um, but after a few months of that, I have noticed that um, there's a little bit of an enthusiasm, quite a bit of skepticism, and just a lot of indifference. So I realized that just telling or asking, encouraging people to use it is just not enough. So I decided to develop a kind of a structured program to get people to use it. Um, and I, we call it the GPT-4 exploration program. That's really when GPT-4 first came out. Um, so we decided to um, give them a structured way to, to learn how to use it. Um, and so my talk is not really about a, a tool, but how to get people to use a new tool. So um, I developed a 12-week program. Um, basically with three purposes. One is, well, let's figure out how to you know, leverage technology to, to help us do our work. Um, and we all, you know, we're always, always ask, being asked to do more with less. That's impossible. Maybe with better technology, that could help a little bit. Uh, second thing is to increase the AI literacy level. Um, I think that we just don't know enough and we have a lot of misconceptions on the new technology. So one thing to, to help, help with that is to just learn a little bit more about the technology and not just using it, but different parts of it. Um, and um, so that's what I want to do with this program. And also, um, a little bit of cultural change. We know there will be changes coming. Um, let's get into that kind of mindset. So that's what this program is about. Um, 12 weeks with two weeks of introductory kind of prep. Um, we asked them to read up on it, think about an individual project um, to apply this you know, tool for, um, and we asked them to attend a, at that time there was a library, like a boot camp, AI boot camp for library, so we asked them to do that. And then the next eight weeks, we, um, we get together um, and um, they would document everything they have done, and we get together every other week, to, almost like a community of practice, to share the progress and um, uh, lessons learned, challenges, and all of that. That was great. We loved that. Um, that got people talking. And then, um, and then the final two weeks, we wrap that up to prepare to kind of share that with the rest of the college and then the university and hopefully wider and the wider audience so people can come learn from that experience. 
So we asked for 10 volunteers, and we asked them to you know, tell us what they want to do with the, um, the, the uh, chat GPT or GPT-4. Uh, mix of skill level, we wanted to people from different areas, different kind of enthu enthusiasm level as well. And some were kind of like, why, you know, this is kind of weird, and some were just really into it. And the, there are some, you know, individual projects that they use it for data plans. Um, uh, one person from the university press used it to synthesize a lot of um, text for them, uh, cataloging metadata, um, using AI to generate FAQ versus the human generated FAQ and see how they, um, how they fare. Um, my assistant loved it using it. She has her own assistant to take minutes for her, so that was great. Um, so we did a pre-program and post-program kind of little survey, and we asked them about how familiar they are with these AI tools and their kind of self-rated AI literacy level. And you can see they're you know, below midpoint at the beginning. And after that, they all increased all these kind of um, uh, levels, so um, at least over midpoint for, um, for those. And then we asked them to just share you know, what are some of the challenges, there are some technical limitations, Prompt engineering came up quite a bit, knowing how to use it well, how to communicate with these. Um, but they all said they gained these skill sets uh, during it, and they feel more confident using it. And, and this is you know, heartwarming for me because they like the program itself. They rate it pretty high. So um, we're thinking how we can even you know, improve it a little bit for um, future iterations. He, so, uh, these are some of the um, qualitative comments. This program changed AI from a threat into a collaborator. Uh, I gained confidence in using AI to enhance my daily work rather than replace it. And the freedom to experiment made AI less intimidating. And some of the key learnings, um, well, ha having hands-on experimentation increased their comfort with AI and prompt practice built critical skills. And that's an important thing. A lot of people think that AI will replace critical thinking. I think by leveraging how to prompt, you can actually teach or increase, enhance your critical thinking skills. And tailor projects amplify the engagement. A lot of times at the beginning when I ask people, oh, use it, they have no idea what to use it for. So having some kind of individual projects or something that they want to use the program for actually help them um, want to use it. Um, but there are also some challenges. Data privacy was the, the, the one thing that will come up every single time when we talk about it. what can they put in there, what can they upload to these programs. Um, even though ChatGPT or GPT-4 has a function to, um, to not ask, you know, saying not to use your data, but people were not sure. Um, and prompt engineering, difficult but essential. They recognize how important that is but also it's not that easy to become really good at it. And also, they all recognize that AI lacked subject matter expertise, at least at that point. Um, so I, I know people, different companies are working on that. Uh, so that's kind of my um, presentation. I have these structured um, um, plans. If people want to kind of use it, contact me. I'll share those uh, with you with this, um, the structure of this program. So thank you. Thanks, Leo. So, again, I'm Elias Sok, um, the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Research at Clemson University. And a little bit of context, background information about Clemson. Clemson University is a public land-grant research university in Clemson, South Carolina. It was founded in 1889. Clemson is the second largest university by enrollment. The current enrollment is close to 29,000 students, 80% of them undergraduates. Cooper Library, our main library, um, on good days, uh, we get between eight to 10,000 students in the library. So why did we start with a, an AI tool, trial, and subscription? It was a combination of opportunities and maybe challenges. This year, Clemson launched a new strategic plan, Clemson Elevate, with three priorities. The first one, to deliver the number one student experience. In the library, our mission is to provide 
services and resources that will meet the needs and expectations of students and faculty. But expectations change. These days, many of our students come with the expectation of a custom experience and just on time assistance. Also, as was mentioned earlier, during the spring semester, we saw an increase in the number of questions regarding references or citations. In many cases, references for publications that simply did not exist. So what did we do? Well, we talked to friends and colleagues who were working on similar initiatives. This included informal and roundtable conversations, including uh, some at CNI in Denver in the spring, as well as some Zoom meetings. By the way, that's how we got connected with Jolen. We also talked to a couple of vendors, and we asked for demos. And later, we arranged for a trial over the summer. After a successful summer trial, we recommended to pay for a one-year subscription, and we created a research guide, which included information about the tool site and also instructions on how to use it. So for the trial, June 20th to July 20th, we got feedback from faculty and graduate students, representing five colleges and 11 departments. In a one to five scale, faculty and grad students rated the tool at 4.57. So we started a subscription on September 1st, but because of some accessibility requirements and the creation of a research guide, the official launch did not happen until October 1st. The graphic on this slide is a quick comparison between the summer and the overall engagement over the last four months. So while unique user accounts only grew three times, from 94 to 270, the assistant queries feature, which is similar to the ChatGPT query box, grew almost 19 times from 120 to more than 2,000 queries. Searches and report views also grew two to three times respectively. So what's next? What are we going to do to continue with this? Well, we will continue to work on some marketing and promotional activities, especially at the start of the spring semester. We are planning for several presentations. One for the department chairs, a group of 100 or so chairs in a room that I think they would be interested to hear about the benefits of a tool like this. Our team will also present at a Clemson conference in January titled Teaching in the Age of AI. Finally, and because things will continue to change, for instance, Site, the company, was recently acquired by Research Solutions. So, we will keep an eye on the future development of AI tools for academic writing and research. And with that, we have about four minutes for questions. So, question for the panelists. Um, Devin Savage uh, from uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. I understand you can't see anything up there, so I'm over here. Um, but I actually had a question about Kenius, um, which I was also very fond of, um, and we uh, have, have trialed at my institution as well. Um, but one of the things that I noticed about Kenius is that um, I think though it draws from Open Alex, they've restricted the number of articles that they actually pull from uh, based on like English and some other criteria. Um, so that, or, it sounds funny to say, they're only pulling about 50 million articles uh, to look at, which is, which is great, um, but it is a fraction of what most of our institutions have access to. I wondered if you had any comments about sort of the scope or the, the future or any sort of like interaction you've had about that. Uh, that's, that's a great question, and that's something that um, we did have conversations when we were looking at the tool um, and, and going down the route of, of having a trial and thinking about you know, how can we 
identify gaps in the coverage in, in what Kenius is recommending. And I mean, like you said, like it's only 50 million articles. <laughs> How do you even begin to approach that, that problem space? But I do think it's important for us, especially since we aren't focused in one academic area, you know, we're trying to be as broad in terms of coverage as we can possibly be. Um, so I think that that's, and, and I don't know if I have an answer for, you know, whether, I, I, I think that there was an update recently where they added more articles to their index, so that's encouraging. And it's my understanding that the technology is such that they can be pretty agile and, you know, what they can add to their index and to the tool. Um, which is also encouraging. So I think it's just it's just a space that we're trying to keep an eye on and think about when we're designing our assessment. How can we ask these questions in a way that's you know effective and and kind of getting at at the root of what we're interested in? So thanks for thanks for asking that. That was really that's helpful. My question is for Leo. So Leo, um, I was wondering a couple of things. Did you provide subscriptions for your staff, or did you, did you tell them which tools to use? Uh, yes, we did provide that, and we asked them to use uh, GPT-4. That was the, the kind of most popular one at that time. Um, but however, we, we encountered quite a bit of issues with the subscription. Apparently, they didn't like us using one P card for multiple accounts. Uh, so I guess they wanted to charge us for the enterprise version. But anyways, so that was an issue that we couldn't really figure out how to deal with. Somebody got kicked off, you know, for a while and, and all of that. So that's something to pay attention to. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then a quick, quick follow-up question. So in my institution, I've been trying to get my colleagues uh, to embrace exploring these tools. And several of them are adamant that they do not want to do that um, until they can be assured that it's completely private and um, they're also very concerned about helping any company that is um, perpetuating bias, um, using biased training sets, um, copyright um, violations. I was wondering if you had staff who were similarly apprehensive about using these tools and what you've been able to do, if anything, to um, or how you've negotiated those conversations? Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. I so we do have those um, mindsets as well, and it's I think it's a common mindset for a lot of us to want to wait until something is perfect to use it, and things may never get to that point. Look at the internet, right? Um, so what I try to tell them is we at right now. Rules are being set at the national level, business level, any level for AI. They haven't been set. So we have actually a voice, some kind of influence in that. And the only way to be able to do that is to learn more about it. And so that we can say something with informed kind of thinking. Um, and the only way to learn that is like try it out in low stakes situations, for example. Right. So that's what I would say to them. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, one quick question uh, for all four of you, I would think. Do you have a sense of which academic departments for faculty or which majors for students are most likely to use your resources for AI? Uh, for the summer trial that we did at Clemson, um, more than 50% came from uh, STEM disciplines. Mm. Now, this is, uh, it was over the summer, so primarily grad students, right? Uh, we are eager to learn about <laughs> who, um, the type of demographic that we might be able to get for, this, for the fall semester, and that's uh, coming. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll say that uh, information science was uh, the discipline that we saw the biggest uptake in. Uh, we saw a lot of people downloading from STEM disciplines, but we did see some uh, from the English department as well, uh, probably because of uh, the focus on information literacy, which was a concept that they were more comfortable with mm. um, and that kind of angle on it. Um, but yeah, we really wanna encourage people, even from these non-STEM focused disciplines to kind of just get hands on the tool and just 
you know, uh, get some experience using it because uh, just ignoring it is not uh, a safe strategy. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just say from Carnegie Mellon's perspective, we, we don't know who exactly, at least in, the, in terms of Kenius, who's using the tool, but we do, have, we do have a list of names, and so we could cross-reference that data at some point to try to you know, put that picture together a little bit to understand it. But I do think that um, in, in many ways, I imagined undergrads would be our sort of primary demographic that we'd be targeting with the tool because it's sort of designed to help them uh, search differently, search better, but then if you have been searching for your entire career and finding the same results, then I could see you know, a later career professional or faculty member having success using tools like that for more of the serendipitous discovery that um, it's supposed to help with. So I could see, you know, um, I could see it being broadly useful across the board for us. I don't have any data, but it seems like it's more at the individual levels than, than units or department levels. So it seems like it's the mindset of the, that individual faculty rather than that department. So. And you had a, a varying <coughs> range of mindsets. You mentioned uh, right. skepticism to enthusiasm. That's right. So within even that discipline, that could be a range as well. So it's really on the individuals, I think, at okay. this point. And you had 10 people. Ten, that's just my college, but I'm leading yeah. the university, so I can see it from different disciplines as well. So, yeah. Thank you. And, and the data that we got from the trial at Clemson was based on the feedback that they completed voluntarily because site doesn't keep track of any of that. So, um, like the 1,000 users right now, there's no way for us to keep track of who they are. I think we're about over time. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day.